Hey, welcome to the second episode of The Fast Break. I am your host, Drew Ambergy. My first guest on today is going to be Danny. I got a couple more guests coming on later today. It's going to be an exciting show. It's kind of a crazy week here in the NBA as we get ramped up going into the All-Star break. How are we doing, Danny? We're doing all right. Uh, so the game that we're going to be talking about, uh, the Hawks and the Raptors. Uh, the Toronto Raptors beat the Atlanta Hawks 106 to 100 on Monday, uh, ending the Hawks' seven-game win streak. Um, this is with an injured Trey Young. He didn't play due to a right shoulder contusion that he got uh, in Sunday's contest against the Lakers uh, in a run-in with Carmelo Anthony. But, um, I mean, honestly, it, it, it was a great game. Back and forth battle. Uh, the, the lead changed a uh, whole bunch of times, uh, and I mean, I, I think what it comes down to, though, is uh, Gary Trent Jr., yeah. if we're being honest. Uh, I mean, 23 years old, uh, 31 points. This is his fourth game in a row with 30-plus, uh, and I mean, just phenomenal play. 9 for 15 from deep, 10 for 22 from the field. Um, incredible, efficient play from that young man. Yeah, so you hit it. it. It was a great game. It was an awesome back and forth one. Uh, good win. Good win for the Raptors. Uh, kind of gets them to 23, 25 and 23 and kind of keeps them in the hunt for the playoffs there. Um, I, I like how they're playing right now. Uh, I don't necessarily know how much of a, how much of a you know, potential uh, you know, player they're actually going to be in the East. Um, now, you said it, though. Gary Trent Jr., 31 points. Um, now, that's... He only guys with streaks of 30 plus points and five plus threes um, are Steph, Dame, and Harden. Uh, so that you know, when you're in the conversation with those guys, that's yeah, when you know you're on fire. Good company um, to be in. Siakam dropped in another 25 points for him as well too. And you know what? The Raptors they're kind of having a weird season. You know, with not having any fans in the stands, it's, mm. it's kind of hard to really assess them this season. They actually had to take fans out. They actually used to have fans this season, and now they don't. So it's just been a really weird year for the mm. Raptors. Um, but I do like their starting five. You know, Siakam, Van Vliet, Trent, Gary Trent Jr., as we mentioned, Scotty Barnes, the really good young player, and then OG Ananobi as well, too. Now... With as good of a starting five as they do have, it kind of falls off a cliff it, it really as soon does. as you get onto their bench. Um, you were telling me earlier that they actually didn't have a bench player that was in the plus minus for the entire game, which is yeah. which is kind of you can't win games like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now they actually did win this one, but that's not a recipe for success going into the future. Do you think the Raptors have any chance of making noise in the playoffs, especially with how kind of crazy the East has been, or is their bench just going to kill them and they're going to get swept in the first round by somebody good? Yeah, if they, if they do make it into the playoffs, I kind of do see them getting swept in the first round. Uh, the Raptors, I mean, like you said, after their starting five, which is a great starting five, and I think that that starting five can compete with just any, com any team in the NBA, like competitively, and, and ha has a chance to win. But um, I don't think they have the depth necessary to make a, any sort of deep and meaningful playoff run. Um, I mean, what, they're five and a half games back. The East is very competitive this year. Uh, a lot of scary teams. Uh, I mean, you got the Bulls. I don't mm -hmm. see really anyone in the East, maybe besides the Bucks, stopping the Bulls in the East right now. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on and talk about the Hawks as okay. well, too. So, obviously, this game, no Trey Young. Now, if he was playing, you'd probably say that the Hawks would win this game. You know, only losing by six, I would definitely say that Trey Young makes up a six-point difference. Mm -hmm. Now, they are 7-3 and three in their last ten games, though. And that's with Trey being a little bit banged up as well, too. You know, they're two games out of the eighth seed in the East. With them finally starting to get healthy here, can they actually make a run in the East as well, too? Because they did make the conference finals last year. And I would say that with all the firepower they do when they do have when they are fully healthy... I would actually give them an outside punter's chance of making the conference finals again because let's look at the Nets. Banged up, storylines, who knows who's going to be on the court for them. Mm -hmm. Heck, by the time this episode comes out, they have, may have uh, traded James Harden uh, to the Sixers for, for Ben Simmons for all we know. So things are kind of crazy with them. Milwaukee doesn't look like they're awake yet. 
haven't seen the Bulls in the playoffs, haven't seen that group of Bulls in the playoffs. Uh, I'm, I just don't tr necessarily trust anybody in the East. And, and honestly, if Trey Young got hot for a few weeks, I could see them going back to the conference finals again. What, what, what do you think? Now, outside punter's chance, uh, <laughs> honestly, I still think that's a little bit generous. I think that the, the Hawks have dug themselves too deep a hole at this point. Uh, at, the, at this point in the season, they're seven and a half games back from making the playoffs. Um, and it's just, it's so competitive in the East. I, I don't really see an opening where, where the Hawks come in, say, as an eighth seed, mm -hmm. uh, and then beat any potential number one seed in the East mm -hmm. um, in, in a seven game series. Uh, so no, yeah, if, if they came in as a number eight seed, probably not. Yeah. You know, having to go against one of the best teams. But, uh, you know, we're, we're only at the all star break right now. If they finished the last 30 or so games of the season on a really hot streak, say, Say they went 20 and 10 and got up to a four or five seed, maybe or a six seed even, and they just mm -hmm. weren't playing one of the top teams in the East. I think they would actually have a decent chance of, of uh, at least winning one series. And you know, I, I just think they do have a chance. I believe in Trey Young. Mm -hmm. I watched him go into MSG and tear them up. I watched him go back and forth with Giannis. You know, I just I think I have faith in them, and I think they got a lot of offensive firepower. Mm -hmm. um, that they can throw at a lot of teams. So I, I actually do think the, the Hawks have a pretty good chance here. Um, now, Kevin Herter, 26 points today, or sorry, mm -hmm. on Monday. How, how has he been playing and, and uh, you know, what, what kind of does he give them from, from an outside shooting perspective? Uh, I, I think Kevin Herter gives them a lot in terms of drawing the perimeter defense away from Trey Young. Um, I mean, when, when you have a, a shooter as special as Trey Young, uh, any time he wants to move without the ball, um, I mean, he's constantly double teamed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think Kevin Herter being there uh, allows for uh, a, another shooting presence on, on the outside. And on, in this past game, too, I mean, he was really impressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, he started the game off six for six, finished nine for, uh, nine for 12 from the field. Um, with 26 points, uh, I think he was five or six from uh, from the three point line. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, red, stuff. the red headed wonder. I mean, when he gets on fire, you can see it in his hair. Yeah, That's why he's got that red burning. hair. No, he's actually somebody that I kind of wanted the the Celtics to take a look at. at you know, coming up on the trade deadline because they're obviously another team that as well that could use some outside shooting to take away from the playmakers such as Trey. Because if you got a guy that Trey can dish it off to, and you can count on him to mm. continuously make threes and stretch that defense out, it just kind of changes the whole offense for a team. And now, without Trey, it was kind of on him to score 26 points, which if Herter's scoring 26 points for you, uh, and he's taking a majority of your shots, that's not necessarily a recipe for success there. Also true. But props to him for scoring 26 points. Uh, without Trey in there, so that you know, giving keeping them in the game and, and helping them only lose by six. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the, this is a couple of teams where they're just kind of in no man's land right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the Raptors, they're kind of still in that honeymoon phase after winning the championship. Yeah, you know, their fans aren't going to get too upset with them about not being too you know as competitive as they should be, just because you know when you're a team that hasn't won a title in a long in a well that was the first title in the history of their franchise. You know, you kind of give the coach, the front office, everybody a little, little bit of leeway, and you're kind of okay with me mediocrity for a little bit. But the Hawks really should just be playing better. And I know they've had some injuries here and there, but their their defense their defense hasn't been playing that well. Now they didn't do too bad in this game, but uh, you know, with with the offensive pi firepower that they have, they I really expected them to be you know a top three four seed in the east right now so mm -hmm. it's kind of been a it's kind of been a rough year for them um well awesome thanks danny uh i just had him on to talk about the hawks uh, next i'm gonna have on uh nick and so thanks for coming on danny it was fun man my pleasure oh, all right really we're going we're going knuckles today all right all right welcome back now i'm joined with nick He's going to be uh, on talking about the Cavs and the Pelicans game from last night. Now, this one was a good one as well, too. We saw the Cavs eke one out against the Pelicans, 93-90. to So a really low-scoring affair, good defense from both teams out there. 
Now, the reason this one was probably close, because the Cavs are a lot better than the Pelicans, is because there was no Garland, who has been having an amazing season, all-star. Um, you know, the Cavs came out with some balanced scoring. They had Brandon Goodwin, who is on a two-way contract with the G League team. He had a game-high 21 points. Love dropped in another 15 and 11. And then Okoro had 16 and Jared Allen at 16 points as well, too. So just kind of getting it from everywhere for the Cavs last night, especially without their primary ball exactly. handling goal, uh, ball score. That's not the right term. Score. <laughs> just their ball, ball score. Of course you got to score with the ball. <laughs> There's their score. Um, but, yeah, so the Cavs got a nice win. Pels. They're, it's rough for the Pelicans. Yeah, it you know, is not looking too You know, they can't even win when the other team's best player is out. Uh, Devontae Graham had 20 points. Good for him. Uh, but let's, uh, let's, let's talk about the Cavs here. Now, Now, good win. You know, always nice to eke one out when you don't have your best player. Yeah. The Cavs are now 31-20 and 20 in the East. They are, are they a real threat to actually make the conference finals and possibly go to the finals? Because they're only one game out of first place. Um, to be honest, I don't know if they'll be able to make to the conference finals. They don't have a guard right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've just kind of been going through it. Like, Colin Sexton's out, season-ending injury. Ricky Rubio is out, season-ending injury. So I think the key factor that they're going to need to go forward to the Eastern Conference Finals, they're going to need guard play, mm -hmm. for sure. Someone to facilitate the floor. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, Garland hopefully won't be out too long. Now, with the loss of Sexton and Rubio, which really hurt, because Rubio yeah. was playing really well. I was yeah. loving the way Rubio was playing, having a career year, honestly. Because they did lose Rubio, I think they're going to get like a, a – loss of player exemption or something like that, where they're okay. going to have a little bit more extra money to spend if they want to do something at the trade deadline. Now, there is, there, is some, there is some options out there for the Cavs. I'm not sure who they're necessarily going to go after, who can actually fit within you know, their budget, but yeah. there are some decent options out there. But I do think you're right. They're going to need, they're going to need some guard play because the bigs are certainly not the issue for them. Yeah. Jared yeah. Allen, who they basically just got gifted – from the Nets. I can't believe they didn't want him. <laughs> uh, Kevin Love is playing really well as well, too. Kevin Love, how are you feeling about him? Because he, he looks rejuvenated right now. He looked totally, completely just done with the Cavs. They weren't going anywhere. And then as soon as Garland started playing well, you know, uh, and then, of course, Mobley. Mobley is going to be the rookie of the year for me, of course. Yeah. I think he's awesome. He actually didn't have a very good game uh, the yeah. other night. He only had four points, but He's a rookie, so you're obviously going to have your ups and downs exactly. as the rookie year goes. So they got Love, and then they got Jared Allen, and they got Mobley, which is just kind of insane big, bigs to have. They got a great, uh, they got a great post scoring. But yeah, so what do you think? What do you think is their ceiling? I guess for the East. I mean, like you said, the, having Kevin Love come off the bench with 15 and 11 is huge. Like, mm -hmm. like I was saying, they have a, they've had. The play off the bench has been crazy. Goodwin had 21 off the bench, shooting 8 of 11 from the field, and then Kevin Love adding his 15 and 11 rebounds. That's great bench play. Mm -hmm. So I think their bench is going to need to play a lot due to the lack of guard play. And so their bigs, it's going to come from the bigs. I'm probably, as far as they go in the playoffs, maybe first, second round. Mm -hmm. I think they could sneak out the first round, but I think the second round, depending on who they end up playing, they probably lose. But I think it would be a good series, probably like, six or seven games at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think they can give anybody a real scare in the playoffs, but they are super young. You know, two of their best players are Mobley and, of course, uh, Garland. And those two guys just don't have any playoff experience yeah. at all. Jared Allen has a little bit, but not necessarily a lot. Kevin Love, of course, NBA champion Kevin exactly. Love. He does, but the, you know, one player is not going to be able to, yeah. you know, especially coming off the bench and not playing, playing mm -hmm. more limited minutes, if you want to call it that. And look, and if and if, say the Nets keep slipping down with exactly. how many injuries they have, and and if the Cavs are in that three seed and you got the Nets in that six seed, that's a, that's a brutal draw. Yeah. So we'll obviously monitor that as we get towards the end of the season. But there are some tough matchups if the Cavs do, you know, finish in the wrong seed there. So I think you're right. I actually do like them to maybe win a round, yeah. especially if they can finish like second or third, depending on obviously who the matchups are. Yeah, exactly. I do think that they have enough because I love Mobley, love, love, love. 
<laughs> and I do love Garland as well, too. So I, I really like the Cavs. They play really well together, and I think they could definitely make some noise in the playoffs. But, yeah, just a little bit too inexperienced for me right now. Now, going down the line with how good Mobley has been this season, I mean, I think, like, sky's the limit for Mobley. I think, honestly, he could be the face of the league in about six years. That's mm -hmm. how, like, that's what I think his potential is. I love Mobley. So I think the uh, Cavs have a bright future, except, especially with Garland. We'll see if they want to hold on to Sexton. That's kind of the wild card with the Cavs right now is because they do have just this piece. They have Sexton, who's a really good player, yeah. obviously got injured, just going to be out the entire year and the playoffs. But they can trade him for something. If they really wanted to go in this year, they could trade him for something. He's worth, I think in my eyes, he's worth a lot. You could mm -hmm. even, I don't know about multiple players, but you could probably get him like in a multiple player deal and then – add like maybe two more pieces to the puzzle? I think the Cavs should be really smart with it. I don't think that they should necessarily get, you know, 50 cents on the dollar for yeah. him just to make a push this year. It's got to be the right trade. Yeah. But I do think he has enough value to where if you got the right team to trade with you, they could get a starter, maybe a decent bench player uh, in a trade as well too, or maybe somebody that can be an impact player for you. And then, a, and then a pick down the road as well, exactly. too. So I think the Cavs actually do have a lot of wiggle room right now, uh, which is kind of nice that they just kind of have this piece. They got a couple of pieces right yeah. now that they can move around. They got actually a lot of guys on, like, mid-tier contracts, which are really easy to trade if they did want to go in and, and get a big guy at the, at the deadline. Maybe, like, somebody like a Jeremy Grant. I haven't heard them in any talks with them, yeah. but if they wanted to, uh, that, that's also a possibility. Yeah, Jeremy Grant's a great role player. I think he'd fit mm -hmm. well with these big guys for the Cavs. I think he would, too. And that would, of course, make their size even more like daunting. Because right now, they, when, they run, when they run that big lineup that they have, uh, they, they can really just be an absolute force on defense. I mean, you saw them, you saw them this game. They, they held the Pelicans to 90 points. Now, the Pelicans are injured, of course, as exactly. we talked about. Yeah. But still, holding any NBA team to 90 points is still impressive because everybody can shoot yeah, now. That game, this game was pretty low scoring. I mean, the Pelicans jumped out to a quick 8-0 run. Mm -hmm. And so the Cavs coming off a loss to the Pistons, which was very embarrassing. <laughs> uh, started off pretty slow, but then they ended up, you know, coming back. But it wasn't like, I think the whole game in general was low scoring. Like, it was like 39-38 to 38 at the half, which is like, for an NBA game, is pretty ridiculous to be that low scoring. Yeah, that reminds me of something like back in like the early 2000s when games were being won like 75 to 80, and yeah. that was just ugly basketball. They had to change the league because of that. It was so ugly. They had to give more uh, leeway to offensive players, hand checks and stuff like that. Um, let's move on to the Pelicans. I know nobody wants to talk about them because <laughs> they're boring, but what can the pos Pelicans possibly do? I mean, my suggestion is that they just move cities and start over and trade everybody and get rid of everybody in the organization. Maybe go s to Vegas. I don't know. Uh, you got to you got to switch gotta everything. Come, if a team's moving, they got to come to Seattle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Seattle's getting an expansion team for sure. I want them, but I don't even know if I love the Sonics. I don't even know if I would want. <laughs> I, I don't even know if I'd want the Pelicans to be honest. But no, yeah, it, that was a little bit joking there. But I do think that. Uh, it's just tough to be the Pelicans because yeah. nobody cares about the Pelicans in New Orleans. It's it's you're either a Saints fan or or you root for the LSU Tigers. Like that's basically exactly. about it. Nobody really cares about the Pelicans down there. But what do you think they can possibly do to get this thing turned around? I mean, right now I think the big thing for the Pelicans they got to figure out what's wrong with Zion because I think, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's seen his highlights at Duke. He was probably arguably the best college basketball player to ever play. Um, so his whole situation where he's only played like half his rookie year and now he hasn't even seen any game action uh, this year so far. And everyone's like heard the rumors about his like weight issues or whatever. <laughs> but I think with him out, that's huge. I mean, it was their number one draft pick. Yeah. So, Yeah, that certainly is the biggest concern yeah. for them. I mean, and that's he's the whole he's got the whole franchise yeah, on his shoulders exactly. and his ankle right now. Yeah, he this injury keeps getting delayed. Yeah. And I'm getting a little bit worried about it. Now, a lot of people might think, why would he come back right now? They yeah. suck. They're not going to the playoffs. No yeah. matter how, how well he plays, they are still not going to the playoffs. You got Ingram in and out of the lineup. He was yeah. hurt. I don't think that 
there's any need for him to necessarily come back yet. No. So maybe they're just being as cautious as possible. But from the reports I've read, there's a little bit of disconnect with the Pelicans and Zion yeah. about just what his injury status is. It kind of is under wraps. There's no timetable for no, him to come back no at table. all. It's kind of reminded me of the Kawhi thing, except Kawhi, you could kind of understand it because he's just a quiet person. Yeah. With Zion, it kind of just seems like two different – he's got his own personal doctors, he's got the Pelicans doctors, and it kind of seems like there's just a big disconnect. And I'm getting a little bit worried because he's a young player. This kind of stuff could mess with your mental. And for, you know, the difference between being a great player in the league – and being an average player in the league is basically just confidence. Yeah. And, well, I mean, there's obviously skill, but they're all good. Um, so I just get worried about him, his confidence, and honestly him just staying in shape considering it doesn't look like he's going to be back anytime soon. No. And I think with his injury, I don't think they'd do it yet, but I could potentially see Zion in trade rumors. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he's, if he's not being a, a use for the Pelicans, I don't think there's really a real need to keep him around. They could, I mean, he's worth a lot. They could get Time. multiple good role players for him. But I think the Pelicans, they just need to get healthy. Like, Brandon Ingram's out. Zion's out. Uh, I think Josh Hart got hurt last night. I saw in a report today that he's going to be out in the next couple games or whatever. So, I mean, they're still really young. And I think Josh Hart's a pretty uh, one of the better role players in the league. But I think they're just young. They just need a little more time. And once Zion's healthy, I think – we'll see the Pelicans just keep improving and improving and improving. Yeah. I just hope that he can get back sometime soon because obviously the last time we did see him healthy, he was shooting like 70% from the yeah. field, dropping about 30 a night, you know, snatching about 15 boards. And he's a great passer too. One of the most dominant forces in the paint. Mm -hmm. With his size, like 6'8", 6'9", 285 or when he was healthy at least like a young Charles Barkley because he wasn't that he's not that big height wise mm -hmm. but he's still able to get in the paint get the rebounds and get up and score in the paint because he just got that second jump that's so Ex fast extremely explosive he's one of the most explosive players I've ever seen so hopefully he can get back and then I do like Graham on their team as well too and then of course Ingram uh, waiting for him to really take off as well. But, yeah, I think you're right. If they can get everybody together and playing healthy, I do think there's a light at the end of the tunnel because they are yeah. young. But it's going to really start at the top and being able to surround Zion, who needs to be your 1A player. The yeah. weirdest thing for me was that when he was having an amazing season and they had Devontae Graham – or not Devontae Graham, Brandon Ingram taking, like, the last second shots when you had a guy that – He's either going to score or get fouled yeah. on almost every possession, especially late. Uh, they had Ingram taking the last second shots, which just did not make sense to me at all. So no, I agree. Hopefully they can get a good coach in there, somebody that can nurture Zion, get him playing the right way, and, and hopefully get his, they can get this training staff to get his body yeah. right. Because right now he's eating a little bit too much gumbo down there yeah. in New Orleans. There's always this whole weight issue is probably the biggest story mm -hmm. of the Pelicans because – you know, who knows if those pictures are photoshopped or not, but he does not look in playing shape whatsoever. Not at all, not at all. So, yeah, we'll see how the Pelicans do. I obviously, I mean, it wouldn't even surprise me if they were good next year with everybody healthy. So, yeah. you know, you keep your head up, Pelicans fans. Like I said, I think it's going to take a few uh, – it's going to take time, probably a few years, for them to start sneaking in. I think give it like three to four years, they could probably see themselves in one of the playing games, mm -hmm. I would say, but – I think right now for all you Pelicans fans, it's just going to take time. Yeah, just give it some time. All righty, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking Cavs and Pelicans yeah. with me. It was awesome. And, and uh, next on, we're going to have uh, my boy Ryan. So stay tuned. All right, welcome back. I'm joined by my friend Ryan here. How are we doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, good. Of course. He's on to talk about the 76ers and Grizzlies, which ended up being one of the best games I've actually seen all season. Now, we saw the 76ers win 122-119 in overtime, and this was a fun one. Uh, we had Jaw jumping all over the place. We had guys shooting threes. We had Maxi going off for 33 points. It, it was a fun one. What did, what did you think about the game? 
I, it was a thriller. I think one of the biggest things I loved to see from that was really kind of a lot of sharing the wealth because we mm -hmm. didn't just see the superstars like John Wright and a breakup, a wonderful breakup performance from Desmond Bain in that one, I think, for the Grizzlies going off for, I think he had like 34 or something. Yeah, in that Bain, one. Bain 34 last night, which I think was his season high. He's been having an amazing season. Uh, you, you touched on it. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit from everybody because Embiid was out, which I was a little bit worried for at first because I thought it might be a blowout. But, man, the, the backups, not the backups, but, you know, the role players for the Sixers stepped up really well. Tyrese Maxey, like I said, 33 points, 8 assists, which is always nice to dish it out a little bit too. Tobias Harris, 31, 5, and 5, finally playing like, pay, playing for the money that they're actually paying him. Um, and then Drummond, Drummond, you know, every once in a while he puts in a really good, solid performance. And you kind of see the old Drummond from the Pistons that we, that, you know, that everybody hyped up. You know, 16 points and 23 boards for Drummond. Probably the best rebounder we've seen since... Who knows? Maybe Rodman, honestly. Um, but, yeah, Jaw had 37. Of course, he's just a superstar at this point. I mean, he, what, what else can you really say? I mean, just absolutely clutch down the stretch. You know, he, uh, he's got those acrobatic plays. The, the one last night with, what was it, five, six seconds left before the end of uh, regulation where he just drives in the paint, gets nailed, throws it up, gets an and one. I mean, Jaw is unbelievable. He scored above 30 points in the last five games. I love Jaw. Jaw's arguably my favorite player right now, besides Jason Tatum. I'm a Celtics fan. But I love Jaw right now. And then Bain, Bain, who was a, felt, a former Celtic as well, he drops 34. For the season, he's been shooting 47% from the field, 42% from three, and he has 18 points per game. He's arguably in the all-star conversation which I did not see coming, and it kind of sucks because he got out of our grips. Um, what do you think about Ja and the Grizzlies? Now, they've started to cool off. They're 6-4 and four in, the, in the last 10, but, uh, you know, I still think they're a contender in the West. What, what, what do you feel about them? I think so. I think you have, if you have a guy like Desmond Bain who's really starting to kind of come into his mm -hmm. element, you got a guy that's talking about being in the run for the most improved player of the mm -hmm. year compared to where he mm -hmm. was his rookie season. And so I think if you're able to... And we've seen Ja really prove himself. So I think if you look at a guy like Ja and you try to kind of, kind of what the Pelicans have done with Zion, while they're start trying to anyway, yeah. try to center, really center, center the team sitting around Ja, who's really kind of starting to come into his own. A lot of people, I think, were kind of skeptical of the draft. It was kind of this, this Zion or nothing mentality. But you look at guys like R.J. Barrett and, again, Ja Morant, you know, they deserve to be in that conversation too. Mm -hmm. So I think for the Grizzlies, you try to continue to – center as much as you can around jaw knowing that he is starting to kind of prove himself and if you've got a guy like desmond bain who's starting to really come into his own you've got a, a superstar team in the making mm -hmm. i think already just right now so similar to what the 76ers have going on with mb who's of course in his prime right now but i could definitely see this team making it into the playoffs i don't exactly see them having a deep run of the playoffs mm -hmm. This is a very young squad. We have to remember that some of the oldest guys on the team are like 28 years old. You're talking guys like Steven mm -hmm. Adams, who have some of that playoff experience initially. But again, kind of with some of the other teams we've talked about here on this show, we haven't exactly seen, we haven't seen a lot of that playoff experience from this group yet. And that, mm -hmm. I think, is kind of key. You have to kind of distinguish that between the regular season and then the playoffs. It's two kind of different times to kind of consider. And so I think for this team, I think we'll see them potentially in the first round if they're if they're if they're really popping off they might get into the second round but I don't see them kind of getting much further than that I think again Jaws a great building block for that but they're a pretty young team and when you're dealing with a dominant Phoenix Suns right now my goodness they're I mean, playing even, out of their minds right now yes yeah. even after the loss they had in the finals I think they've still got that fire almost it's almost like it lit a fire underneath them to a certain degree when yeah. you're talking about guys like Chris Paul that have been in the league for a while that still haven't just gotten the job done in the finals and but again you got Doncic you got Jokic who played out of his mind last season put mm -hmm. up some incredible numbers I just think the Grizzlies will be there but I just don't think it's their time yet true true I think they're a little bit too young right now um obviously to be, arguably your two best players are within their first few years in the league you got Jaron Jackson Jr. Triple J and then you got Jaw as well too a lot of J's on this team yeah. um but, yeah, I think they're a little bit too young right now as well, too. But I just don't want to bet against Ja. 
Now, we got a little bit of taste of the playoffs last year. So a lot of them do have, you know, a little bit, little bit of experience, which can go a long way. Uh, we've seen teams that just made it into the first round the year before, and then they really have blossomed, which the Grizzlies are right now. Now, if Bayon can play like this, which I don't expect him to fully, but if he can really be a 15 maybe to 20 points a game per night and consistently stay that way into the playoffs, that really does give him a nice third or fourth option and then gives us gives him a lot more depth to compete with the depth that the Warriors and the Suns have in the West as well, too. Um, now, let's switch to the Sixers for a second because they've got – a lot going on. The Grizzlies, everybody loves them. We'll see how they go as it actually gets to playoff time when it's prove it time. But the Sixers, no Embiid uh, last night for them, but they are eight and two in their last ten games. Tyrese Maxey, thirty-three points, eight assists. Like I said earlier, he's been playing really, really well. He's been playing really well as of late. Drummond, I think Drummond actually gives them an interesting option if they were to get into the playoffs and have a nice matchup in a certain series to where Drummond could actually put up these kind of stats in the playoffs. So it's interesting to see what he's given them on nights that Embiid isn't there and what he can give them off the bench as well too that they haven't really had in the past. They were using Dwight Howard as a backup center. That didn't really work out. Um, so I do like what Drummond is giving them. Sixers, half a game out of first. Can't believe I'm saying that. Does Ben Simmons get traded before the de trade deadline? Do they want to trade Ben Simmons? Or are they praying that he comes back and finishes on a run this season and takes him into the playoffs and hopefully he can shake off the mental cobwebs he has? I think with, and this is kind of all the trade talk that the 76ers have been had dealing with them, uh, you saw the potential offer from the Kings, I think, that was on the table. That went through as of just recently, so that's done. I think... This, here's the thing, the Sixers are in win-now mode. You've mm -hmm. got a guy like Embiid who's sitting in his prime right now. They want to take advantage of that the best they can. You're talking about a guy that's in the run for the MVP race. Yeah. And so I think here's the thing, because the Sixers have been asking for a really high price for a guy like Simmons that no one's really willing to mm -hmm. offer really at this time because it's a, high, it's a high point to ask for. So I think I don't see Simmons going anywhere right now for the Sixers. I think they're going to... If they're really, like, if they're really bent on a trade for sure, and they're desperate to want to get rid of him, I think they'd have a much better chance trying to leverage him more in the off season than they do perhaps right now. You've got a little bit more time, a little bit more options then. So, and who knows? I mean, I've seen these these Sixers. They like Simmons. They just don't like the drama that's really being kind of centered around the Simmons issue right now. So, I think if if we if they can if the Sixers can somehow get Simmons to like playing in Philly, which I don't see that happening yeah. in the future, but if they can try to turn it around, which has happened for players in the past, then they may choose to hang on to him. But I think for the time being, they're just going to want to hang on to him until, until probably the offseason so they can maybe try to get a better deal for him, have some more time to kind of work out maybe a multi-team deal, mm -hmm. a multi-player deal. I've seen Candace Parker, who's talked about the possibility of maybe bringing James Harden on. as He's got a player option he's got next season, so you could see that from him. You have the potentially someone like maybe Bradley Beal if the – if the Sixers think that that's enough value coming out of that. But I think, I think for Sixers, their fans, and everyone watching, I think they're going to be playing the waiting game for now. Yeah, at, at first my prediction was that he was going to Sacramento. I think the best thing you could do is send him to a franchise that where there's just no pressure, because there's no pressure in Sacramento. There's never has been any pressure in Sacramento. And so I think it would be good for him to go there. They get Fox back. Fox can play a little bit of defense, obviously not to the same level as St Simmons. Simmons is one of the best defenders in the league, if not the best defender in the league. And, you know, he could kind of go there, work on his shot, get right, work, you know, and just work through all the issues he has without any pressure on him. Because Sacramento is just going to be happy to have him there. I thought that would have been a good trade for both Philly and Sacramento. That one didn't go through because, gosh, they just want way too much for him. Now, the Harden one is interesting. I do like the Harden one as well, too. That works for both sides. If I mean, the Nets obviously wouldn't want to do it, but if Harden wants out and he's not help, happy, then, then they want something back for him. And, and the thing with Simmons and, and, and Philly is that 
his value is so low right now. They want him to play. They really do. They want him to play so that he can at least get out there and show them. And they, they would pray that he would have a, at least a nice 10-game stretch where he'd play really well so that they, could, they, so that they could raise his value even a little bit. His value right now is just trashed, just trashed. No, they, they can't get a good trade for him. Um, so I think the, bet, the, the thing that Philly is just preying on is that he changes his mind, comes back, plays well so they can trade him in the offseason. And you're right, you, that was important, that wait until the offseason to trade him because that's when teams that, who knows, maybe somebody has – a uh, deeper run than they thought they were going to have into the playoffs, and they think they're one piece away. So they trade for Ben Simmons. His, his value goes up a little bit. You know, we've forgotten it's been a full year since he choked in the playoffs and wouldn't do a layup against Trey Young. Um, and hopefully, you know, his value comes up a little bit and they can actually get a little bit more for him. But, yeah, it is a tricky situation, but I do agree with you. I think he stays put for right now because I don't think Daryl Morey is going to flinch. I don't think Daryl Morey's flinching at all. So uh, I don't think he gets traded with the deadline coming up pretty soon here. Now, Embiid. This season, shooting 50% from the field, 29 points, al almost 11 rebounds. Having, a, having an MVP season, like I said, has the Sixers a half game out of first place, and they don't have their second best player. And they, they've gotten a good contributions from Curry and, and Harris, and, and of course, Maxie is one of the most improved players in the league as well, too. Do you think he should be the MVP? Because right now I have, I still have Jokic, but with the last month Embiid's has, he's making a great case for himself. Absolutely. I mean, you, you talk about kind of just the dominance of Embiid of a guy in the paint for sure. I think he definitely deserves to be in the conversation. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. But I think for me, I still kind of have my money. I'm kind of going back and forth between Giannis and Jokic here. I know it's kind of the... Well, you say it all the time, but I mean, you look at the dominance in the way that you know, Giannis has really changed the game and just dominated in so many facets. Mm -hmm. just, all this guy really needs is a three-point game, and he's he can do anything. So. God forbid that happens, because <laughs> it, it might be over for everybody if he gets a three-point shot. I mean, and he's not he's gotten a little bit better, but still not quite there yet. But I, 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 I he's agree. getting a smooth stroke. He's getting he there. He does. He does. Now the thing with <laughs> the thing with Embiid, and and it is impressive that he has him so close to that number one seed. But Jokic still has this Denver team who's obviously missing Murray and also missing some other players as well, too. I'm trying to remember his name, Aaron. <laughs> um, and so he's got, he's got guys out as well, too. And they, you know, they just don't have nearly as much, I think, pieces as the, as the Sixers do as well. Too. And, and I think that the Sixers have a better coach as well uh, with Doc. So I think... It, Jokic's season has been a little bit more impressive, especially since his PER is the highest of any player ever right now. It's him and it's Giannis. That's kind of where we're at right now, the two highest PERs in the history of the league. So those two guys, I think you're right, are the front runners right now, but Embiid is quickly making it up those ranks. And it's going to be an interesting finish, and, and, it, and it's, it's, it's fun because it's not over yet. You know, we got, we got months left to decide – to who's, who's going to be the MVP, but right now, but right now, I still have Jokic, but MVP, but Embiid's close. So yeah, um, well, thanks for coming on, Ryan. It was awesome talking this game with you. This was a fun one to talk about, and uh, we'll see how the Grizzlies and 76ers come on down the stretch. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so thanks for tuning into the fast break once again. Uh, I hope to see you next week, and have a good night.